We, um, there's some questions I want to ask you this morning. In fact, as we do that, we're just going to have a couple of guys with microphones come around and, and just uh, to ask you some questions. So let, let's see how we go. We're talking about keychain leadership. You'll notice today, for the first time, I'm using PowerPoint. Oh, wow, imagine. Um, and there's a reason for it, because I wanted to share some stories. But here you go. Who loves coming to Forrester's Beach Church? Come on, let's just see. A... Oh, what about the rest of you? Hey, you should all be loving coming here. All right, so here's my question. What makes it so good? And if you've got an answer, just hold up your hand. The boys are going to come around. What makes coming here so good? Just here. That's it, right in there. Long time ago, a retired pastor heard that we were moving from Waitara to Center Coast. And he said to me and to my wife, go to Arena Church on Entrance Road. It's the friendliest church on the coast. Woo, there we go. Oh, someone ought to say amen to that, right? <laughs> amen. That's your thanks, Bill. All right. So, yes. So we've got an amen. Yeah, down here, yes. We have lived in Tumbiambi for a terrible long time. And um, it was always a long way to go to church. So for us, it's just around the corner. It's only six kilometres. So it's close. It's convenient, right? So it's a friendly church. We're close, convenient. What other reasons do we have? What, what do you love about this church? Yeah. It's the fellowship and being included and felt loved and welcomed. Oh, I like that. Okay. Yeah, I like that. The fellowship being included. Yeah, down the back as well. Um, really enjoyed the Sabbath school. That It was really interactive. Um, yeah, that was my It was thing. awesome yeah. Sabbath school last week. Like, it, every week I've been. Oh, every week. Every week's like that. Yeah, of course every week's like that. We've come to expect very high standards here. I love coming to church to help others in the community. Love it. I love it. Thanks, Michael. I love how it nurtures the children and it helps them to grow in many roles. Oh, someone ought to say amen to that, right? Because that's so good, right? There's lots of things. All right, we could, we could have a lot more of those. Yeah, one more. Go, go Helen. Oh, one more. Thank you. Please stay for lunch, everybody, today. We have a, we're starting our lunches up again after a yes. long Yes. Oh, look, absolutely. Let's put our hands together for our lunch crew. Woo! <laughs> food, right? We're, we're here for the food. That's it. Yeah, amen to that one, right? Good. Okay, what would make coming to Forrester's Beach even better? Oh, see, that's a harder question. Maybe that's a rhetorical question. Keeping on getting closer to God. Yeah, keeping our focus on God and, and, and drawing even closer to Him. I love that. I'd just love to see the church t- tremendously packed out so that none of us could fit in. Oh, now there's a healthy sort of problem to have. Tremendously packed out. So, no, so it's, you've got to get early to get a seat. Okay, like that. I'd like to see all our old family, uh, no, old friends and families come back. If that would be really nice. After yeah, it really would. One more yes, down the front here. COVID, yeah. Well, finally we have a pastor. Oh, well, look, thank you. Oh, look, that leads me straight away to this. Ah, oh, now look at that. Look at that photo. And here's what I want you to notice, right? Yeah, sorry, look at me. Yeah, that's right. How terrible is that? Self-centeredness. Shocking. What I didn't hear you say about what makes Forrester's Beach Church great, and I'm pretty sure I could talk to most of you and the answer would be the same, is that you've got a great pastor. And, and I would be really happy at that response. I would be really happy at that response because that's not what makes this church great. This church isn't made great because you've got a talking head at the front. This church is made great because of the relationships you have with each other. Amen? That's what makes this church great. And if we forget that, if we lose sight of that, then we've lost sight of something that's truly important and truly magnificent about this church. And in actual fact, 
you know, what you didn't say as well is that the pastor is the key to the success of this church. Pastor is not the key to the success of this church. In fact, have a look at 1 Peter 2.9. Come on, here we go. We'll get to the football later, but right now we're going to 1 Peter 2.9. Get your technology ready, open it up. I'm using the old technology today. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a what? A chosen generation, mine says. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy... Oh, there's that word out of our Sabbath school class last week, Sam. That word holy, right? If you missed our Sabbath school class last week, and most of you did, you missed a ripper. It was just out here in the connections room. And what was so good about it is we asked this question. Are you holy? What's the right answer to that? Christ is holy and we are his. So what's the answer then? Are we holy? Yeah. All right. I like that. So if we're connected to Christ, then the right answer is yes. Who agrees with that this morning? Yeah, we should. Because that's what we just read here. That we are a what? A holy nation. A people belonging to God. That we are... His own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness. So we're this royal priesthood. We're this priesthood of all believers. It's not the priesthood of a special group of believers. It's not the priesthood of the anointed at the front. It's the priesthood of who? Of everybody. So this leads me to um, an interesting kind of question to consider. And the question is this then, who are the real heroes? Who are the real heroes of this church? Everybody. Well, it's the elders, it's the leaders, it's the deacons, the deaconesses, it's the property custodian, Bob, who, who's, who's just here and, and taking care of business. It's like, and then it's more than that. Who else? It's the finance team who take care of and count the money week in, week out. It's our, it's our clerk, it's our, it's our safe places coordinator that makes sure that everyone who's working with our children actually makes sure that they've been checked and screened and they've got their police checks and, and that they're all just doing the right thing. And do you realize how, oh, I was going to use a, do you realize how, um, Oh, no, I was going to use just like mind numbing, you know, you just got to tick all the right boxes and make sure it's just like it's a dullish kind of job. And yet it's a very important one and it's got to be done. And if it's not done, we as a church can be shut down tomorrow. So who are the heroes in our church? What about our youth leaders? What about our pathfinder leaders? Going on a camp next weekend and Crosslands is flooded. It's not awkward at all. Just got to bring your lilos, people, and a, and a peg for pegging it into the ground so you can go to sleep on the lilo at night and you won't float off in the middle of the night. You'll be fine. Who else? What about a children's ministry leader and a whole children's Sabbath school department? And what about our worship leaders and this tremendous job they do? And what about our music team and the work that they do? What about our Road to Bethlehem volunteers who just get down there and serve in the community? And what about our prayer team who's the powerhouse behind all that happens here? Let me just pause there for a minute. I see some heads nodding. There's not enough heads nodding to that. Now, Kevin, I'm sorry I missed last night. It was just one of those days in our family yesterday. But prayer is a really important part of our church and there's a really easy opportunity to join in. You know, Jesus said, ask so you can what? So you can receive. And then he said, you receive not because you ask amiss sometimes. And so what's the right way to ask? Well, empty ourselves and and come humbly before him and just ask with an open heart, trusting that he's our father and he wants to give us his gifts, right? Prayer is such an important part of our church. We're going to come back to talk about prayer in greater detail later because I'm a big believer in the power of prayer. 
And then, of course, we've got our, our library and our archives. Like This is the first church I've been to that's actually got an archives thing. And let me just tell you that from being at Maitland Church, how important the history of a church is. They were able to pull out documents from the 1980s and be able to trot that to the conference who couldn't find the documents and say, here it is. It's like, I love that. I love how organized that, that feels and that is. It, it actually helps us understand our history of where we fit in the scheme of things. And all of these are important roles. And everyone who serves in a hospitality in our community kitchen. And if I've called out anyone's name here, could you just stand? If you're involved in any of those, can you just stand? If you're an elder, if you're a deacon, a deaconess, if you're on the finance team, yeah, you should be standing now. Come on, let's see you stand. If you're on the youth team, if you're in the Pathfinder team, if you're serving in the kitchen, if you're doing safe places, if you're doing all of those things, if you hold any job in this church, I want to see you stand. That's it. Social committee. Our, our serving in the community. What we haven't even mentioned yet is the more unsung heroes like our outreach and service teams in our small groups. No, no, stay standing. Didn't let you sit down yet. This is your exercise. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude. But it's like what you do in this church is so fundamentally important that today I just want to acknowledge you. Church, can we just acknowledge all the leaders who step up? And can we acknowledge the leader beyond all of our leaders, Jesus Christ, who actually inspires us all? I just want to pray a blessing on you. Father, I just pray that you will bless our leaders in our church, the unsung heroes who do their bit every week in serving in our community, in caring for our members and in caring for our guests and just taking care of all the basic needs. Father, I pray that you'll pour your spirit upon them, that they would draw closer to you and have a greater sense of mission and of purpose because you're at the heartbeat of all that they do. We pray in your name. Amen. You know, there's, there's so many more parts of our team. In fact, what we've even ignored this morning is the tech crew. You may have seen me walking up and down here a couple of times. And that's because my wife is at home trying to get my mum online. And she's like, it's not working. The, the, the live stream and then I check with the tech crew and they're like, yes, it is. And so I was like, yes, it is. And she said, well, it's not. And then she says, oh, yes, it is. We, we had a wrong date going out. So, you know, for all of those who got caught on the wrong date, we're a month ahead of ourselves on our live stream. But, you know, where would we be without our tech crew? Where would we be without, you know, the, the communications team, the people who just join all the dots and, and just take care of all of those things? It really matters, doesn't it? They really do. And today I just want to acknowledge everyone who takes on those kind of roles. And whether you've got it currently or whether you've had it in the past, what you do in that space is really important. And it really does make a huge difference. And there's so many more. But I want to know this is who are the real pastors of this church? Who are the real pastors in this church? You know, do you get a pastoral visit when the pastor turns up? Is that when you get a pastoral visit? Well, for a lot of people, that's what they would answer. Yeah, that's the pastoral visit. I just want to redefine that. Because a pastoral visit is when you do a visit with someone in church. When you care enough to actually say, hey, Jacob, how, how's your spiritual life going? You know, let me pray with you. Or, or when, when he shares a problem, or when Neil shares, or Joy shares a problem, and, and I'm starting to connect, and it's just like, well, let me pray for you. At that moment, ministry's taking place. Or if you want to use a different term, pastoral care is happening when we care. When we care in that way, pastoral care is happening, isn't it? So when was the last time someone gave you pastoral care in our church? And hopefully the answer to that question is not months ago, years ago or never. Because that's sometimes the answer I get. Oh, look, I've never had a pastoral visit. It's like, oh, really? Well, let me just check the, the reality of that, you know, because I'm not the super guy who's able to, you know, leap over a pulpit in a single bound. I'm not able to, you know, be faster than a speeding internet um, transmission. I'm not that guy. Instead, what, what, what guy am I? Well, I'm just one person. Grant's just one person. 
previous pastors, just one person. But all of us, all of us are the body of Christ. All of us have a role to play. All of us have the opportunity to care for someone else. And in that sense, we get to do ministry with each other. We get to do ministry for each other. We get to pray when you've got problems and you reach out to a friend and say, hey, can you pray for me? At that point, that's ministry. That's pastoral care. Just want you to notice that. Just want you to be willing to call it what it is. It's when we care for each other. And you said before, that's what makes this church so great. Amen? Yeah, it is. It's what makes this church great is that we care. It's that we're friendly and much more than that. Now, let me tell you my story. Oh, what a great story. And Dallas, who's here with us with Colleen today, goes right back to my very first assignment at church. Um, I was the pastor at St. Martin's Church. That's the, the guys there on your left and in the screen. That wasn't their church. That's where we went for a historic um, gathering where we would you know, have a monthly radio broadcast where we would sing online and preach online and it would be broadcast on a community radio station once a month. It was a lot of fun. I actually learned to kind of sing in that. I'm, I'm alongside Noel Barlos who used to, you know, I did his funeral for him years ago, but Noel, dear man, and you learn so much at a funeral, right? And what I discovered at his funeral was that he used to be a bikey and get around on a bike. And he was this, he's, he's the Bob Stubberfield of, of St. Martin's Church when I met him. You know, he was in his late 70s, 80s, not that Bob is, but it, it's just like that was Noel. And, and Noel was doing all of that. And then, then and, and he was just the kindest man you'd ever meet. And I couldn't imagine him being a bikey, but he was. And he was a plumber. And he was on the job in, in Christchurch. And while he's on the job in Christchurch, here he is singing with three other friends. Four of them all up. And what were they singing? They were singing hymns on the job, barbershop quartet style. And it just did my head in. It's just like, oh, fantastic. Well, he taught me to sing in that first church. I used to work about a 36-hour week working for St. Martin's Church. But I had a second job on top of that. My second job on top of that was actually the, the, being the Christchurch uh, citywide youth pastor. And we had, a, because of the geography of Christchurch, it was just like one youth group. It was just all the church youth used to hang out together. And um, so I used to work 36 hours for St. Martin's. And then I used to work about 30 hours plus over the weekend. By the time you take Friday night and you finish up and then you do um, Sabbath afternoon, Saturday night and Sunday sports and all of those things. It was just like, yeah, life was just this one giant roller coaster of adrenaline pumped action on the weekends. Not all the time, but very frequently. And then... Bob Larson, who is the, um... Helen, can I get you just to whip out and get me some plates? And Bob, can you bring me in a little table? I just realized I needed those. Thank you so much. I, I, I should have actually arranged to get those before. But so Bob was our, our, um, our youth director for the conference. And I remember Bob taking us down to Mount Hutt Retreat. They used to call it, it was actually Methven Youth Camp. Um, it got renamed years later. And, and there we'd have our summer camp. Now, this is South New Zealand. Their idea of summer is not anywhere near our idea of summer. Um, and to have it in April is nothing like summer, but they'd do all the summery things. So they'd go swimming, they'd do water sports, and the water was always freezing cold. Ah, thanks, Bob. Let me, let me give you a hand with that. Yep, cool. All right, this is going to be great. I'm going to need some volunteers. So, so Belle, you, 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 can you pick some volunteers for me? Yeah, yeah, Bella, thanks. Just, I just need one, one volunteer, really. In fact, no, maybe two volunteers. If you could just find me two volunteers, it'd be just great. And, and so there we were at this camp. And, and so it was a summer camp. It was about 100 kids there. We've got two dormitories and a hall, and the hall is just noisy. And in the noise of that, that's, that's fantastic. This is great. We'll just, we'll just use the crockery ones. That's it. 
and hopefully we won't break any. In fact, these ones here might even be better. And while that was running on, while the camp was running on, it rained for several days in a row. And so, no worries, my email address, my private one is Real Ideas Man, and I am. So I just stepped up and it was no trouble at all. Yeah, come on down, this is going to be fantastic. And, sorry, what's your name? Rosanna, thanks Rosanna, I'll get to you just in a sec. So throughout the, that whole camp, I just stepped up and we just did indoor games. Now Randall, imagine your camp next weekend and it's just all indoor games all weekend and suddenly you just had to rack your brain with 100 kids like you will have next weekend and it's just hard work, right? It just seriously is. So I got to Sabbath of that camp and I'm in a comatose state, just lying down in the bed in the bunk room and, and the rest of the camp's going on, but I survived. Well, that was my experience for the next several summer camps. Was it sustainable? It's not a hard question, church. All right, so here's the challenge. Rosanna, I want you to um, see how many of these, in fact, we might need to add a few extras to it. Um, and hopefully they don't go on the floor. If they do, I'll try and catch them. Sorry, what's your name? Will. Will. Okay, Will, I want you to start trying to see. You've got to get as many of these as you can spinning on here, and you've got to keep them spinning. And, and you, can, you can start now. So now's a good time to start. So just put it on there and get it spinning. You know, you just, you just start. Okay, so you get one spinning, and then you go over here. And that's okay, it's still spinning, and then you catch it and you, you get it going again, okay? And if it goes off the edge, you've got to catch it. So that's the idea. So, so away you go. Just start getting them spinning. Yeah, that's it. F you flick from the top. That's it. And now get the next one spinning. You, you get, you've got to get more. You've got to get more spinning. Yep, here we go. Get another one spinning. Yep, and another one. Come on. You, you, yeah, that's it. Keep them going. Keep them going. Yeah, yeah you've only got one spinning. That's it. Now, now here's another one. That's it. Now get it spinning. And here's another one. All right. How are they going? <laughs> All right. Helen, I hope we didn't break any of those. I think they look all good. Thank you so much. Now, how, how, how hard was that, by the way? Uh, yeah, it was tricky. Yeah. It was really tricky. You had to keep focused. Yeah. yeah. yeah what else did you notice? They didn't spin. It's hard to keep them there. Yeah, this is a basic leadership thing, right? So imagine that's a ministry in the church and that's another ministry in the church and all of those are ministries in the church and these are more ministries in the church and one person, oh, the super pastor, is here and he's actually keeping them all going. Yeah, how sustainable is that? Thank you so much. In fact, you don't even have to be a super pastor you just got to be a local ministry leader in a church, you know, like, oh, I'm the Pathfinder leader. I'm the youth leader. And at one church, I was doing both. And, and then you try and keep them all spinning. How hard is that? And then you've got your job and then you're a parent and you're a father or you're a mother. And, and you're trying to juggle all of those things at once. And it's just really difficult to keep everything going. And the sense of overwhelm that can come with that is huge. And that, of course, is my story. That was me early on in ministry. And then literally, this was the training. I don't know if you ever remember it, Dallas, but Bob Larson actually used this very illustration at a youth camp over in, uh, what's the little harbour thingy? Akaroa, yeah, somewhere around Akaroa there. Yeah, I can't remember, Stuart. Oh, how terrible is that? I'm just starting to lose it. And, and it's just like, wow, how, how incredible is that? That, that? that there's an illustration that just illustrated where I was at. So what's the solution? Solution is to do things a little different. The solution is what our scripture reading was about was in Exodus 18. So in Exodus 18, I want you to notice something here in Exodus 18. In Exodus 18, and we're reading there from verse um, 13. And so it was in the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. That's like a cue you've never seen before. 
I've been to Disneyland. I've been in long queues. I went to um, World Expo in Brisbane. There were long queues if you ever went to the Expo in Brisbane. It's just seriously ridiculous stuff. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that, he did for the people, he said, What's this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning till evening? And Moses said, it's because I'm Superman. He's the guy in the suit. He's the guy with the leotards on the wrong way around. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to... Look at me, look at me. The people come to... Look at me. That's right. They come to who? me that's right they come to me all right we notice that that's the first me right there to inquire of God and when they have a difficulty they come to they come to me that's right they come to me right you've got to get that right see you, you've got to come to who you've got to come to me because I'm the expert right you've got to come to me and then he goes on because you know he's got a bit of a me problem so now he's going to change the pronoun from me to not to thee, but to I. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one another, and I. See, he's now he's, got a, he's not just got a me problem, he's got, a, he's got an I problem. Totally does. He's not seeing things real clear. And of course, it takes Jethro, his father-in-law, to actually set him straight with what is 3,000-year-old current state-of-the-art, best thing you could ever teach someone as a leader, advice. It's never grown old since then to now. And that is you've got to delegate. You've got to empower others. You've got to release the church to do its thing. You've got to get out of the road so others can, can actually have their share of the action. You're going to have to start a training program, Moses. You're going to have to find people and, and train them up to, to replace you because you're going to go and you're going to be the lid that holds this whole organization back. So get out of the road and let God work through all of the people. That's the message. It wasn't good. It was going to lead to his burnout. And I, let me tell you, I know a few things about burnout because I've been there. I've got the T-shirt. It's not nice. And so the solution, I remember when I first arrived in Christchurch, one of the first things I did was I set up a, um, a drama group, I set up a, a music band, and I set up a, um, a video recording crew. And out of those, the one that lasted the longest was a drama crew. And the drama crew got together, and this is my wife's cousin, Lance, Lance Bolton. Um, you may or may not have heard or seen him if you've moved in youth circles, and those youth circles overlap with New Zealand. It's unavoidable that you would have met him, because for many years he was a youth director of North New Zealand Conference. And then he was a youth director for the, um, the New Zealand Pacific Union Conference. So he, was, he actually rose to the very top in sort of youth ministry circles in New Zealand. But that wasn't his story. When he was first in the youth group, he was from out of town. He was an outsider. Wanted to get him involved, so he got involved in drama. He was actually in, um, a Bachelor of Arts major at Canterbury Uni. And he ended up getting a job at McDonald's. Don't laugh. He was very good at that job. So good at that job that they made him the, the manager at McDonald's in Maryvale, and he was doing exceptional in that role. It was around that time that, um, that there was a couple of things happen. That I remember that um, we had a youth rally in Christchurch, and the youth rally was in the town hall. And at the same time as a youth rally, there was a regional for the rest of the church. So all the rest of the church were in the main hall, the youth were in the little side hall in the town hall. And, and while that's going on, we have our drama group putting on a drama for that youth rally. I don't know if you remember this one, Dallas, but this was, this was one you could not forget. The drama group had prepared well, they'd rehearsed, they did not know that this was going to be a problem for them, but what they brought in the props, and the props was a giant double bed. 
And so in came the giant double bed for the drama and they placed it on the, the front of the youth rally. And then they, they set about um, their, their drama, which was tackling what is a, an important issue, and that is boundaries and sexuality, and they totally blew it with the, with the prop. It was terrible. They were embarrassed as they were doing because they realized when it was happening that this was not working. They left feeling just incredible shame. And it would have been so easy to have just crushed the life out of that and said, you guys just totally let us down. I'm not letting you ever do that again. That's just, that's it. You're done. You're toast. Instead, I never spoke to them about it. I didn't actually say that that was inappropriate. I didn't need to. They already knew. They, so all I did was encourage them. All I did was give them the next assignment and, and actually continue to love on Lance as leader of the drama team and several of the others in that group. And you know what? They never, ever let me down again. They stepped up. In fact, did they not just step up, but they got so good at their craft. We brought Terry Lambert in from Western Australia, flew him in to, to, to take a youth event. That was their cover for his coming. But really the real reason was so he could invest in the drama team and train them. And they just kept growing and they got better and better. So much so that in what is in Christchurch, the most conservative church, Islam church at the time, they took a drama service the whole service was drama. Just think about that, pushing conservative buttons. And the people from that church came out and said that was the most powerful experience of church they'd ever been through. To be confronted with the, the portrayal of, of real life, real scenarios. And it just knocked their socks off. But that's not the end of the story. Shortly around that time, my secretary, Carmen Reed, decided that, that she'd had enough of being my secretary and she, she was moving on and, and going to different places and that's totally fine. Carmen was great. And at that point, other people were applying for the job and I said to Lance, you need to apply. He was working at McDonald's and I said, you need to apply. And so he did. And I remember the interview with him. And it's just like he was standout material. So then for the next couple of years, he worked as my offsider in the youth department, as youth department secretary. It was, um, that was his actual title, but really he was just an associate youth director in the conference is how I treated him. He continued to grow. We had lots of things together. When I left, he became the de facto director in the conference. The new youth guy struggled a bit and Lance basically ran the department. He then got called to the North Island. He worked with Nick Cross, division youth guy, for, for a while. And then he finally went to Avondale, did his training and came back to New Zealand and became the North New Zealand youth director. And I look at that story and I see in that story all the elements of, of believing in young people and of giving them the keys and giving them opportunity and speaking into their life and then providing training and then having their back. You know, I had a president who wanted to sack Lance. Because we did, we, we produced a, a youth magazine. It was called Green Pastures and Fat Sheep. It's uh, GPFS for short. And uh, why did we call it that? Because, well, we just thought the, the, the biblical illusion, New Zealand is known for its, yeah, for its sheep. The South Island particularly, lots of sheep. So we thought, well, okay, um, we're an agricultural South Island. Let's go with an agricultural name. So green pastures, that's it. And fat sheep is what we want, right? So that's it. Well, we had a Rattling Dags movie review. And, of course, the movie review was, was a bit edgy at times because it's heartland conservatism in the South, but lots of young people were going to the movies. I didn't personally go to the movies very often, just because it, I just didn't want to compromise my role and, and the integrity of the office I was holding at the time. So I elected not to. But Lance did, and he'd write reviews of them. And I remember one occasion he wrote a review, and it was a review of an M-rated movie. It was The Matrix, and he wrote a review of that, highlighting the Christian themes and the problems in it. 
Well, the boss heard about it when a, 15 year, when a mum took a 14-year-old daughter along to see the movie. They were shocked out of their brain, got onto the president and said, that should never have happened. And it's like, well, which part of that didn't you see? The M rating? The fact that here are the Christian themes, but here are the problems in the movie. And if you do go and see it, we want you to start thinking about what you're watching. That was our intent. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. The president wanted the sack glance. I had his back. And leaders, you need to have the back of your team. Really important. And I just want you to know if you're leading in this church, I will have your back. It's really important. That, that we stand there because there are people around who misunderstand. They don't know the whole story. They, they miss part of the story. They miss part of the facts of what's going on. And it's so easy to fire darts. But in that space, if I had allowed that to happen, he'd never be a pastor. He would, you know, what he went on to do in Auckland, their basketball tournament in Auckland. We're talking Samoans, Tongans, Cook Islanders. They believe in basketball almost more than they believe in Jesus, right? They believe in winning at those events. And when they turn up to a tournament, they're not just turning up with the youth group. They're turning up with every other cousy bro that they can round up who plays for A-grade teams wherever they're from. And winning is everything because it's about the mana of winning. So here at this event, it was not uncommon. The event would start like at 7. It would finish about 2 or 3 in the morning. It was just like this giant event that would just roll on until the last teams played off in the, in the grand final. And in the middle of all of that going down, it wasn't uncommon for people to get really abusive, to get angry, for fights to break out, all sorts of things. And the word on the street was, you've got to shut it down. You know what Lance did? The guy the boss wanted to sack, he didn't shut it down. He went and met with all of the youth groups in Auckland and said to them, guys, we've got a problem. And the problem is our Christianity is on display in all the wrong ways at this event. And if you want to go to that event, if you want your team to be at that event, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to rein in all the extra players coming in from outside and you're going to have to rein in the control of your tongue and the, the physical abuse to referees and umpires on court and you're going to have to go to the youth rally in the morning. Totally transform the event. The culture of that event went through a seismic shift. Now why do I share that story with you? I share that with you because what that story illustrates is handing over the keys of authority and of power and you just hand over a little bit, then you hand over a little bit more, then you hand over a little bit more. And pretty soon you discover you're no longer needed. You just got to get out of the road and let him do his thing. And then pretty soon he's actually training up others to do the same thing. And it's a glorious picture of succession planning. Moses had to learn how to do that. And here's the thing. What are leaders? Leaders are, are filled with genuine empathy and authenticity. This photo was taken three days. This was a Sabbath afternoon. On the Thursday night in September 2010 was the first earthquake that hit Christchurch. Pathfinders on the Friday night camped at our place because we just didn't think we should go up into the mountains. We lived on a farm out of town. And then that morning we went up into the mountains and we did our exercise and while we're doing this exercise this here's Alfredo just look at him there Randall he's actually being blown against the fence post if he actually stood up he wouldn't be able to stand without being at a, a, a very great angle I took the photo and I'm sort of leaning like this to take the photo because the wind was probably about 100, 120 k's an hour on the top of there. Not uncommon. And uh, we just climbed to the top of a mountain. We're trying to get our bearings for navigating. This was a training exercise and where we had to go next. Intense. But here's the, that's the background of the photo. But the story is simply this. Leaders need to show genuine empathy. They need to have, be authentic in the journey. You don't pretend to be something we're not. 
be vulnerable. So did I always get it right? Not at all. Did I make mistakes? Sure. Why did I burn out? Because I got, you know, Lance is a success story, but I could tell you all the times that, like for instance, one time at Papua Nui Church where I went home literally in tears. I was the last one left cleaning up after a, a massive event. And I'm sitting in the car and I'm just tears streaming down my face saying, Lord, why does it have to be this way? The answer is it didn't. But the problem that Neil has is Neil is an introvert and doesn't like asking people. I don't like troubling people. Yeah, you're you with me? Yeah, it's just I don't like that. And so I have to get out of my comfort zone. I have to say, will you do this for me? And I'm like, oh, but I don't like asking you. I'm paid to do things. and you're... So I've got, to, I've got to get out of my comfort. I've actually got to step over and actually say, will you help? Will you do this? Will you do that? And guess what? People are willing to step up. People are willing to do those things. And so the tears are tears because it's of my own brokenness, my sense in which I'm my own inability to step up and ask others to do things. Churches are... People, growing people, giving to people at the right time, the keys of power, who grow new people to repeat that process until Jesus comes. We never finish that. So Ephesians 4 says this, that we are the body of Christ. Some are apostles, some are elders, some are evangelists, some are teachers, some are ministers, some are hospitality experts, some are small group leaders, some are the tech team, some are all of these different things. And in the middle of all of that, in the middle of the hospitality, in the middle of everything else going on, what we've got to do, we've got to train and equip the saints for ministry. The ministry of this church is the church doing its thing. It's you. And in the middle of that, what I want more than anything else is you to find a young person who you can speak into their life. Colleen was talking about here today about the talents, noticing the talents that people have. And it's about getting the football. It's about saying, all right, need to pass that on. Who are we going to pass it on to? Here we go. Passing it on. Now, who are you going to pass it on to? Who are you going to speak into their life? <laughs> all right. And then, and then who, you're going to find someone. You're going to disciple them. You're going to get them to understand your role. And you're going to speak into the life so that you can pass it on. And so who are you going to pass it on to? Yeah, don't hit anyone. Don't knock them out. This is not the time. <laughs> All right, and so on and on and on it goes. And even though it's a Queensland rugby ball, don't let that put you off. We're going to pass it on and we're going to keep passing it on because what we have to do, I can't hold things so tightly. Look at me now, church. Look at me. Thanks, Rochelle. <laughs> I can't hold things so tightly that I don't let others have a chance to grow and to step in. There's new generations rising up in this church all the time. We've got to let go. We've got to stand beside them. We've got to encourage them. We've got to speak into their life more and more. And when we do that, we will become not just a great church, but we will become a great church that successfully passes the torch on or passes the footy on to the next generation. God bless you as you think on these things. Father, we just want to thank you so much for Jesus. We're so glad, Lord, that your plan is not that we have to spin all of the plates by ourselves, but we get to do that in community, relying and trusting each other to help, relying and trusting each other to minister to us in our time of need. Oh, Lord, bless us. Fill us with your spirit that we can be empowered to be your church that releases each other for the ministry of equipping each other to do good works here in our church community and in the broader community. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.